Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang. And we are, um... We got a lull in action after our last battle. I think the last battle that we did was... Oh, no, I think that's the next one that we're doing. Yep, got them confused. But uh, after this battle, we got like a month off of uh, battles before another one starts. So, and we're gearing up for the Gettysburg. We got some stuff that, that the action of uh, Gettysburg is taking place. Plus, we still got the Vicksburg campaign coming on. And, oh, we got some big stuff happening in 1863. We got two battles for you here today. The Yazoo Pass Expedition, Fort McAllister as well. And the Yazoo Pass Expedition is going to set up... Uh, it's not going to set up anything. It's part of the Vicksburg campaign. <laughs> it's a whole expedition taking place from February 3rd to April 12th. Um, Ulysses S. Grant and the Rear Admiral David D. Porter is um, going to do some things moving in on Vicksburg here. So Exciting times in the world of Civil War if you're a um, fan of it, not if you're a part of it. No, definitely not. Grant's objective was to get his troops into a flanking position against the rebel defenders. The expedition was an effort to bypass the Confederate defenses on the bluffs near the city by using the backwaters of the Mississippi Delta as a route from the Mississippi River to the Yazoo River. Once on the Yazoo, the Army would be able to cross the river unopposed and thus achieve their goal. The operation would require a deep penetration into the enemy Ooh. territory that was dominated by water, so cooperation between two services was necessary. And as we've seen, too, these guys don't really like to um, participate with each other either. Never. The Navy and the Army. No. Never wanted to. If they would have, they easily could have went up to Mississippi even further than they did. Up? Why would they need to go up? They went all the way to New Orleans. They went all the way to New Orleans. How far do you want them to go? They just couldn't get Vicksburg because it was high up on the bluff or whatever. Remember? Remember? Do you even... Do you even Remember, dude? Been doing this for 52 episodes. Legitimately. Oh, by the way, to Patreon guys, um, these videos won't be unedited, unlike the last ones, because uh, that was a little too weird, because we messed up way too much time, and it's just not necessary. So you get the edited versions of the uh, videos, too. We could put the edited, unedited ones, too, but... You'll get the edited version, so it's actually a good video instead of just stupid uh, starting the same paragraph over and over. Yeah. <laughs> Vicksburg campaign was bogged down in early 1863 following the repulse of the Union forces under Brigadier General William T. Sherman. We haven't heard his name in a while. Well, literally just last episode. At Walnut Hills or Chickasaw Bayou late the previous year. I like Chickasaw Bayou then better than Walnut Hills. Major General Ulysses S. Grant wanted to keep his troops busy until he could begin active campaigning later in the spring, so he ordered them to undertake several moves that would give the appearance of activity, but would not bring on a major battle. Just look busy. Move around here, move around there, spend a couple nights here, right? March over here. I mean, that's unnecessary, though. Why? Really. You don't want to be acting like you're just chilling by camp, having a good time. You know, oh. make, make sure uh, at least think that you are ready for them. Right. How many times these guys have been surprised by the Confederates anyways? More times than they should have. Grant, writing in his memoirs long after the event, stated he did not have great confidence that any of them would prove successful. Although he was prepared to take advantage of them if they did. One of the operations he put in motion became known as the Yazoo Pass Expedition because it used a waterway of that name. <laughs> hey, right. Obviously. I wonder why you call it that. Well, the western part of the state of Mississippi from the Tennessee state line to the north and Vicksburg at the south is part of the floodplain of the Mississippi River. As such, it's quite low in many places. It is, in fact, lower than the level of the river, which we saw when way back in 1861 when they tried to take Vicksburg the first time and their boats kept or the um, the Confederates built a fort. And then it flooded because they're idiots and didn't account for the water level rising. Damn right. The region is therefore occupied by numerous marshes, breaks, slaws, slaws, bayous, lakes, creeks, and rivers that, and the geologic pass were parts of the riverbed. Until the middle of the 19th century, overflow from the Mississippi continued to pass into these waters, and they could be used as alternatives to the main river for water transportation. 
One such route left the Mississippi at a point a little south of Helena, Arkansas, passed through Moon Lake, which is an oxbow lake, which means a former loop of the river that had been cut off when it changed course, okay, uh, and followed the Yazoo Pass to the Coldwater River. All right. The Coldwater is a tributary of the Tallahatchie River, which combines with the Yalabusha to form the Yazoo River at Greenwood, Mississippi. The Yazoo then flows 188, mi- 188 miles to re-enter the Mississippi from its rear. 67 longitude, 87 long latitude. Right. Oh, it re-enters Mississippi a short distance after Vicksburg does the Yazoo. This changed in 1856, however, when the coming of the railroad induced the state to drain some of the land for agricultural uses. To that end, they built artificial levees to confine the river to its main course. Deprived of its principal source, the water level behind the levee dropped as much as eight feet. Wow. That was in 1856. 1856. A few years before the war. Train some of the land. Well, it's nothing compared to Lake Mead nowadays. Mm. Uh, the Army and Navy had distinct but not incompatible reasons to get their forces to the east of Vicksburg. Grant wanted... <laughs> Grant wanted to get his soldiers onto dry ground with no rivers between him and the Confederate defense. Once that was done, he believed that he could flank Pemberton's Confederate army. At the same time, he could divert a part of the expedition up the Yalabusha River to Yalabusha. destroy Yalabusha. Yalo? Yalabusha. Yalabusha. Yalabusha River to destroy a railroad bridge that was enabling the enemy to threaten his own line of communications. Porter's purpose was to use his armored gunboats to destroy rebel shipping at Yazoo City. He emphasized that any enemy ironclads must be destroyed, if possible, on the stocks. Although the two services had divergent goals, this did not affect the expedition adversely. Its ultimate failure is ascribed to other causes. Well, thanks for uh, spoiling it. I mean, I think we all know what happens at Vicksburg. Right. Well, no, this time they succeed. Preliminary survey by Acting Master George W. Brown in the tin-clad USS Force Rose confirmed the feasibility of the operation. Did that on the 3rd of February, 1863. A group of some 400 pioneers under Lieutenant Colonel James H. Wilson dug two gaps in the levee at the site where the old Yazoo Pass had formerly met the Mississippi. At this time, the difference in water level between the river and the former stream bed was eight feet. Damn. So the water rushed through the openings with great vigor, enlarging the gap and carrying away everything in its path. If you guys seen that dam break in uh, mid-upper Michigan, a couple yeah. years back. So I'm sure everybody listening did. <laughs> that was a national thing. Yeah, well, man. By the next day, the gap had increased in size to 80 odds. The flow was oh, so wow. great that the vessels assigned to the expedition could not safely enter for several days. The flotilla of gunboats and army transports passed through the gap on February 24th and immediately proceeded into Moon Lake. All right. The naval contingent consisted of seven gunboats and a tug. A tug. By- Five of the gunboats were a type known quickly as tinclads, vessels of light draft carrying thin armor capable of protection only against infantry weapons, which were the USS Rattler, the Marmora, the Signal, the Romeo, and Force Rose. I thought Confederates had a boat, the CSS Rattler. Mm, Rambler. I don't know. I think they turned it into the Rattler. Maybe. The other two were the larger and heavier Baron de Cobb, which is one of the original city class ironclads, and the Chili Koth, Koth, an inferior second generation copy. Inferior. <laughs> Later, another gunboat, Petrel, and two Rams, USS Lioness and USS Dick Fulton, would join <laughs> the expedition. All right, Dick Fulton. Lieutenant Commander Watson Smith led the flotilla from his flagship, the Rattler. Fantastic. The Army contributed nine infantry regiments that were carried in 13 transports. An additional 600 or so soldiers were sent aboard the tin class to defend them, if necessary, from rebel boarding parties that could be expected in operations so deep in enemy territory. I mean, they got to be some rebels there, right? And they're likely looking to board some ships. Right. And have a party. <laughs> <laughs> they just had some dude do that since they didn't have a radio. Right. It was General Grant. <laughs> General Grant would have sent more troops, but he sure He was too busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't have the drummers on the battlefield. They just had somebody going. <laughs> and all the, uh, 
all the forces in that fucking uh, regiment or whatever had like uh, tight ass pants and right. afros and shit. And they were like, before they go to battle, they like, Kiki, do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does that. Nobody does that? No. That was so like five years ago, dude. Was it five years ago? Yeah, when people were uh, doing the stupid challenge and letting their car roll down the road while they were getting out and then they'd fly down the hill and crash into the intersection or some shit because people are stupid. Grant would have sent more troops, but a shortage of available transport prevented him from doing so. <laughs> That's probably it, yeah. Troops were a part of the The troops were a part of the Eighth Corps. Nope, the thirteenth, sorry. The troops were part of the thirteenth Corps under the command of Brigadier General Leonard F. Ross. Later, they would be reinforced by column led by Brigadier General Isaac F. Quinby, who ranked Ross. He's like, um, you're ranking officer now, boy. Mm-hmm. Well, the Confederates in the meantime were not idle. Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton was aware of his opponent's intent as soon as the levee had been breached, if not before, and he gave orders to Major General William Lauren to stop him. He immediately organized some work details to block the Yazoo Pass and Coldwater River by felling trees across the streams, but they were largely ineffective. Largely. Okay, I'm thinking, like, I forgot. There was ships involved. It was like, the guys, you just made a bridge for them. Right. But they the, didn't. Right. The obstructions were quickly removed by Union Army engineers under the leadership of Lieutenant Colonel Wilson. More serious, however, was a fort that Lauren ordered to be built a few miles upstream from the point where the Tallahatchie and Yalabusha rivers combined to form the Yazoo. Yeah, we'll put a fort right there. But your guys' fort sucks. Right. They don't do very good jobs, and they don't defend them well. Right. And they don't have artillery, anyhow. Right. Well, not a lot, anyway. <sighs> Sad. That this war is even still going on, to tell you the truth. <laughs> ah, a peculiarity, of course, is of the Tallahatchie and the Yazoo is that they flow past each other on opposite sides of a neck of land that is only a couple of hundred yards wide. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Here, Loring's men made a barricade of cotton bales, covered them with layers of dirt, and mounted a pair of heavy guns. Nice. This hastily constructed earthwork was named Fort Pemberton. Mm, not a fort. Or sometimes Fort Greenwood. Not a fort. He had other batteries lying in the bank of the Tallahatchie almost all the way to the Talabusha. And still others or, on the Yazoo. Or the Yalabusha. Yeah. In addition, he had built a boom or a raft that could be swung out to block the stream. And in the channel just downstream of this, he scuttled a ship, the former Star of the West. Oh, Star of the West. Uh, uh, Lauren had time to set up the defense because the progress of the, the progress of the Union flotilla was painfully slow. Instead of pushing ahead with his ironclads, Lieutenant Commander Smith insisted that the entire force, gunboats and transports alike, should move together. Well, why? They could move only in daylight hours, but Smith continued to recoil his ves- vessels during the day. Recoil his vessels, sorry. Furthermore, they would waste hours in the early mornings and would stop at midday for lunch. Well, you got to have lunch, guys. Right. Moving faster right. than the current, according to Smith, brings us foul. Why? Ross protested strongly against the lack of urgency, as did Smith's second-in-command, Lieutenant Commander James P. Foster. Their pleas were disregarded. Smith's slowness may have been a result of his decline in health as he had been sick with the ex- when the expedition started, but he had stayed on, hoping that he would improve when his fleet was in motion. Well, that would probably make it worse. Instead, right. he only got worse, and he eventually had to relinquish command to Foster. By then, however, it was too late. It's too late. Mm. <clears throat> the Union flotilla arrived in the vicinity of Fort Pemberton on 11th of March, more than five weeks after the levee at Yazoo Cut had been breached. A probe sent out by the Army accompanied by Chilikov found that the terrain near the fort was too marshy to support an attack by infantry. The attack would have been carried out by the gunboats, aided by whatever artillery could be brought ashore and brought to bear. Not even all the gunboats could participate, because the river was rather narrow. Only two boats could engage at a time. Oh, no. And these only bows onto the enemy. The initial probe was followed by a more determined bombardment by Chilikov and Baron de <laughs> Oh. In this action, Chilikov sustained the most serious injury of the operation. Uh, it's a boat. They don't have injuries. Right. A shell from Fort Pemberton passed through one of her gun ports while the 11-inch gun was being loaded, striking the shell and causing both to explode. Damn. The gun itself was not harmed, <laughs> but 14 members of the gun crew were killed or wounded. The gun itself was not harmed, but the people who, who operated it were. <laughs> Jeez, another man was killed by a later hit. All right. Baron de Cobb did not suffer any significant damage because of her superior construction and... Because the Confederate gun crews concentrated their fire on the more vulnerable Chilikov. Yeah, I mean, you take one of them out, you might as well take the softest one. Right. 
get it out there, man. Next day, 12th of March, was given over to repairing the damage suffering by the gunboats and giving additional protection by placing cotton bales on the four decks. Smith also landed a pair of 30-pound parrot guns. He landed them. (laughs) One from his flagship Rattler and the other from Forest Rose. He also sent ashore a 12-pounder howitzer. They were sighted some 800 yards from the fort and, like the guns in the fort, shielded by cotton bales covered with doit. The two ironclads returned to action on March 13th, this time assisted by the shore battery and the mortar boat. Confederate gunners again concentrated their fire on the Chillicothe. Although she only lost uh, three wounded among her crew, uh, the pounding she took from the enemy artillery loosened many of her armor plates and generally revealed the inadequacy of her construction. Right. Baron de Cobb, although not punished so severely, lost three of her officers and men killed and three others wounded. The rebels lost some of their men also when a shell entered a magazine. Ooh, blew that shit up, huh? Although it did oh, not never explode. Mind. <laughs> it's few set fire to the ammunition stored there, and the fire killed one man and burned 15. How the hell did it set fire to the ammunition, but the ammunition didn't explode? It's crazy. Another shell killed a man and wounded two others. At the end of the day, Fort Pemberton was basically unscathed. The gunboats, however, particularly Chillicothe, particularly Chillicothe, had been badly battered. If I can't like batter a, my boats, how am I supposed uh, to? How am I supposed to make them a cake, man? Smith failed badly to note. batter like a trailer park wife. Hmm. Smith failed to note that the Confederate fire was slackening at the end of the day, their ammo supply being depleted. Mm, he failed to note. What an idiot. Right. Smith spent the next two days repairing his vessels and landing a broadside 8-inch gun taken from Baron de Cobb. He didn't land anything. He just took them. He and Ross decided to make a determined assault on Monday, March 16th. The ironclads would be pushed closer to Fort Pemberton than before in order to be better able to silence its guns. They would advance side by side with the mortar boat lashed between them. Infantry would follow in uh, tin clads behind them, ready to go ashore as soon as the guns in the fort were knocked out and a suitable landing place could be found. The planned attack collapsed almost immediately when a series of shot or shell hit Chillicost casemate. <laughs> makes sense. Jeez. The impact buckled the armor plates in such a manner that the gun port stoppers could not be raised. Chillicost was forced to retire. Smith decided to pull the relatively undamaged Baron de Cobb out of action as well. That was essentially the end of the Union effort. Smith finally realized that his health was impeding the expedition, so he turned command over to Second Command Lieutenant Commander James Foster. And James Foster was like, dude, we knew this was happening the whole time. He's like, what do you want me to do now? (laughs) Jeez. So I can take the... Right. Man. Foster and Ross decided together that further effort would be futile. So the flotilla began to withdraw the very next day. <laughs> so the dude already knew they were going to withdraw. He was like, I'll give you guys the uh, right. distinction of doing it. Jeez. They had not gone far when they encountered a group of Union transports bringing in reinforcements under the command of Brigadier General Isaac Quinby, Uh-oh. whose appointment predated that of Ross and who therefore ranked him. Quinby ordered Ross to go back down the river to renew the attack, and he persuaded Foster to accompany him. Who but he could, he could not order, order Foster, though, right. but he's like, well, come on, man. Uh, a few desultory probes were launched in the next several days, but Quinby found what Ross already knew, that the land was unsuitable for an infantry assault. Right. Dude, that's the whole area around there. Right. That's why they can't get the Vicksburg. Nope. Quinby received orders from Grant to return to the Mississippi, where he and Ross were needed for the next assault on Vicksburg. The flotilla withdrew from Fort Pemberton for the last time. By April 14th, all had returned. All right. I mean, they tried. What are you going to do, man? Took some damage to a boat, had to retire, too. That, um, yeah, especially when it's only wide enough for the two, so you're best, essentially sitting ducks. Right. Because you probably can't turn around so fast, so no. they're just slamming the damn boat. Then you take some trash bag out there like the chili cough. Right. That's, I mean, come on, dude. These guys are idiots, man. It's just, there's three years now into the war almost, and two years at least. What? Yeah, 61, 62 years in, and they... Still don't know this stuff. No. It's ridiculous. The stupidity that they keep on doing. Well, maybe it'll work this time. I think a lot of it is, though. Most of these people never been to this part of the country. And? That's a marshy, swampy, hard-to-navigate stuff there, man. That's the only thing the South had on their side. But still, this this war should have been over with Four months ago. Right. So who got that battle? The Confederates, uh, I guess? Clearly, right. I think it was a stalemate. Uh, I don't think how it would be. 
<laughs> Union did nothing. All right, moving on. First battle of Fort McAllister. That's another battle, huh? Oh, this is um, otherwise known as Home Alone. <laughs> yes. It was a series of naval attacks that took place in uh, January 27th to the 3rd of March. Damn. Yeah. Month long. Mm -hmm. So was the expedition we just covered. Cool. This happened in <laughs> Brian. <laughs> this happened in Brian County, Georgia. Brian. The commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, Rear Admiral Samuel F. DuPont from the north, decided to test operations of new monitors against Fort McAllister before conducting a major neighbor operation against Charleston. He's like a little dry run here. We'll see what these guys can do. Yeah, because they're going to need that because Charleston's going to be rough. Right. Fort McAllister was a small earthen fort located along Genesis Point and armed with several heavy cannon to defend the great Ogeechee River approach south of the Savannah. Uh, Savannah, Georgia, that is. <laughs> Not in, like the African <laughs> Savannah. It was expanded repeatedly by adding more guns, traverses, and bomb proofs. Yeah, it was like they were like a survival game and they had to like get enough materials and right, yeah. every day they're like right. building up their ship. Right. Cool. Ob obstructions and eventually torpedoes, which are mines, completed the riverine defenses. All right. July 1862, the blockade runner Nashville from the Confederates ran up the river to escape the blockaders and would remain trapped. Learning that the Nashville was lying near the fort, uh, Admiral DuPont ordered Commander Charles Steedman to make a reconnaissance in force and to tr to destroy the fort if possible. It's not. At this time, the garrison was commanded by Captain Alfred L. Hartridge of Company A, 1st Georgia Volunteer Infantry, a.k.a. the DeCobb Rifleman from DeCobb, Georgia. The main battery consisted of five thirty-two pounder and one forty-two pounder smoothbore. Uh, July 29th, Steedman led the wooden gunboats... Wooden gunboats. Come on, guys. Right. USS Paul Jones, the Unadilla, the Huron, and the Magi against the work in the 90-minute-long range exchange. Oh, fantastic. Steven. Oh, the 90-minute-long range exchange. Right. Stephen found that approaching the fort would cause unacceptable losses, and he was like, we're getting out of here. He withdrew. An 8-inch Columbia added to the fort in August, and the garrison was replaced with the Emmett Rifles and the Republican Blues. Oh, that doesn't go together. <laughs> right. Under Commander John L. Davis, the Federal Gunboat USS Wissahickon, and Don, <laughs> <laughs> and a mortar schooner, engaged the fort for several hours on the 19th of November, 1862. The fort did not reply to the initial long-range bombardment and waited until the warships ascended the river to the gun's effective range, obviously. When the lead vessels reached 3,000 yards, the garrison opened fire, immediately scored a hit. Holding the Wissahickon below the waterline. Oh, you don't want to blow the waterline. The Federals withdrew. Damage to the fort was minor and readily repaired. And only three men were slightly wounded in the fortifications. Admiral DuPont dispatched an ironclad in an attempt to capture the fort, sink the Nashville, and burn the Atlantic and Gulf Railway, Railway Bridge farther up the river. This would provide the first test of the new Posaic class of ironclad monitor armed with the massive new 15-inch Dahlgren cannon. At the time, the heaviest cannon mounted on a warship. Single turret of the new class contained one 11-inch Dahlgren in addition to the 15-inch. Wow. Mm. On January 27th, eight, uh, 1863, the monitor USS Montauk, three gunboats, and a mortar schooner again engaged the fort. Commander John Warden of the Montauk shelled the fort for five hours at a range of 15 to 1,800 yards. Wow. Penetrated and tearing up the parapets, uh, but causing no lasting damage or casualties. Right. It wasn't doing shit. Likewise, 13 hits scored by the fort's artillery did little besides denting the monitor's plate and sink a small launch. Right. Well, what are you going to do? The defender simply repaired the damage and earthworks during the night. <laughs> so it's basically nothing. They're just wasting ammo at this point, dude. February 1st, Warden tried again to silence the fort. The prior night, Federal scouts had removed several mines from the channel so that the vessels could more closely approach. There you go. The Montauk spent another five hours bombarding at only 600 yards away. Significantly closer. The garrison commander, Major John B. Galley, was moited oh. from the south, and seven were wounded. Major George Wayne Anderson was placed in command of the fort following the death of Major Galley. The monitor was struck by 48 rounds and the turret jammed for a time. Following this engagement, the river defenses would be augmented with the placement of nine Rains torpedoes mines right. in the channel near where Montauk had engaged the fort. All right. Well, unable to run the Federal blockade, the Nashville had been sold and converted into an armed commerce raider under Captain Thomas H. Baker. 
It was renamed the Rattlesnake, the Rattlesnake. And on February 27th, Baker attempted to make the open sea during rainy weather, but was deterred by a blockader. Yeah. Returning, the raider ran aground on a bent up river from the fort, but still visible to the blockaders. The next morning, Warden anchored the Montauk about 1,200 yards from the fort and about equal distance to the rattlesnake stuck in the riverbed. The monitor began firing on the stranded ship, and the fort fired on the ironclad in an attempt to distract it. After only a few minutes, the Montauk sent its fifth shot into the raider's hull. This and subsequent shells produced a fire and eventually explosions, which destroyed the ship. Oh, man. The Montauk had fired 14 rounds in all. That's, That's a hell of a 14 rounds, though. That's a lot. I guess. As the Montauk withdrew down the river... It struck a torpedo. Oh. Quick action by the commander and pilot steered the vessel onto a mud bank as the tide receded, sealing the leak until repairs could be effected. Well, look at this fucking guy, huh? Following temporary patching, the rising tide refloated the boat. Eventually, the Montauk was sent to Port Royal for permanent repairs. Except for that. After early engagements with the fort, Admiral DuPont recognized that a single monitor turret lacked a raid of fire to force the capitulation of the earthen battery. He therefore ordered three ironclads, the USS Patapsco, the Passaic, and the Nahant, Nahant, to test their guns and mechanical appliances and practice artillery fire by attacking the fort. Okay. The Montauk was to be held in reserve as its 15-inch guns had already fired a large number of rounds and its durability was unknown at that very time. Captain Percival Drayton of the Passaic would command this expedition. Who are you, Captain Percival? Drayton. Drayton. Drayton, Drayton, Drayton. <laughs> Anticipated an attack, the malleable fort was again expanded at an 10-inch Columbiad. The fort then consisted of a 32-pounder rifle, quote-unquote, which was an old 32-pounder rifle smooth, <laughs> which was an old 32-pounder smoothbore yeah. rifled so that it would fire an approximately 64-pound rifled bolt or somewhat lighter shell. Damn, bolts. A 10-inch Columbiad, an 80-inch Columbiad, a 42-pounder smoothbore, then three 32-pounder smoothbores, one being a hot shot gun. They fired up those damn uh, um, shells. the red hots, dude. Mm. Mm. And 10-inch mortar and a connected work. Mm. Additionally, several sharpshooters were placed in the marsh on the opposite side of the river near where the monitors were likely to station during attack. Uh, March 3, 1863, the three newer ironclads conducted an eight-hour bombardment. They were supported by five gunboats and three mortar schooners held out of range of the fort's guns. Several steamers containing the 47th New York Infantry awaited nearby to occupy the fort when subdued. Well, if you can do it. Might as well, right? I mean, if you can, other than that, you just got a bunch of guys there for nothing. The lead monitors anchored about 1,200 yards from the fort and commenced shelling as the fort attempted to target the gun ports when the turrets rotated to fire. The bombardment knocked out the 8-inch combine? No. <laughs> I'm an international harvester. <laughs> <laughs> the bombardment knocked out the 8-inch Columbiad, tore large holes in the face of the fort, and for a time disabled all but the 10-inch Columbiad, oh, well. before several other guns could be returned to Soyvis. The Confederate sharpshooters hidden in the marsh fired on Captain Drayton and Commander Miller when they emerged on the deck of the Passaic. Neither was seriously injured, and they withdrew into the vessel. I bet they did. Grape shot was fired into the marsh to discourage any further sharpshooting. Uh, while most of the damage experienced by the ironclads was the result of firing of their own cannon, the tenant's Confederate mortar battery inflicted some potentially fatal damage to the Passaic. The mortar battery commander, Captain... Robert Martin realized that explosive mortar shells would have little effect, so he filled each shell with sand instead of gunpowder to increase its weight and density. Right. Wow, really? How would that work? Hmm? As long as you have a charge to get it out of there. I guess, but that's what the gunpowder is. How the hell did sand make it poom? Poom. I don't know. Well, either or, this would result in it retaining more velocity and momentum when it struck the thinly armored deck. Oh, shit. One of these, one of these struck and partially penetrated the ironclad, only being stopped from penetrating all the way through because it stru uh, struck a beam. So, good for that beam, huh? All right. So, there, here, here's a thought. Build your whole ship out of beams. Right. <laughs> That'd be one heavy son of a bitch. Right. As the tide was receding, nightfall was coming. The naval vessels withdrew. Hmm. Captain Drayton attempted to prevent repair of the earthworks overnight by maintaining 13-inch mortar fire on the fort overnight. Wow. This is a waste of ammo, but I guess, is it, though? Since uh, you're, you're, no, you're not you letting want, them You not don't letting want them, them to uh, build up their shit again. 
This prevented slave labor from conducting the repair, but it did not prevent Confederate soldiers from working. Damn. They were like, we need these slaves more than our uh, (laughs) um, uh, soldiers, apparently. The damage had been repaired by the next afternoon, and the loss of the fort's mascot, Tomcat. Oh, no. Damn. Was reported to General Beauregard. Oh, he's pissed. He's got it now. Look at this. is how John Wick started. Right. General Beauregard's going to be like a fucking force the rest of this war. (laughs) Not Tomcat. (laughs) Right. The attack on the fort had failed, and no further naval assaults were ever ag- ordered against it again. Mm. Valuable information about several defenses. Well, they weren't really trying to take the fort, if you remember. They were right. just trying to do their stupid right. um, demonstration right. to see what and if they took to it, go they to took Charles. It. Right. They took it, they took it. Valuable, valuable information about several deficiencies of the monitors had been revealed by the action, and efforts would be made to remedy them. Damn, yeah, I mean, there's a try, Ronnie. You had to do right. what you got to do. First test of the 15-inch Dahlgren gun and single turret monitors against the sand parapets of the Fort McAllister had revealed several things. The very slow rate of fire of the very large cannon and two gun turrets resulted in little offensive power and allowed defenders time to fire against the open gun ports, then take cover. The defenders could fire several times as rapidly. The several monitors firing at once did not create a sufficient volume of fire to suppress the battery. The monitors were subject to jamming of their turret rings or mechanical failures of the guns that could take their battery out of action. Spalling effects of broken bolts on impact posed a hazard to the crew even though the armor prevented penetration. The thin monitor decks were vulnerable to plunging fire from heavy mortars. Yeah, plunging when it's going. Right. Yeah. Uh, earthworks could rapidly be repaired overnight or the following day so that a garrison could return to full effectiveness. They weren't hitting the fort at all. Oh, they were. They were just... Too slow. Right. They were hitting, and then, but these guys were fighting back faster. Long range mortar fire against the fort was so inaccurate as to be ineffective. Right. See, told so you they weren't hitting the fort. <laughs> pressing fire against earthworks would be required overnight to limit the ability to repair damage. Right. Obstructions in mines prevented patches past forts, even though the monitors might be invulnerable to the fort's guns during the passage, right? They can get past. They, can, they, they, they could. They can get past the guns. They just can't get past the damn mines. Damn right. Sand forts held up well to shelling, while mud forts did not. Yeah, I guess mud's more, sand's more. You would think sand would. And mud, and mud would. would. But, you know, well, whatever. That's why they put sand in uh, concrete. Right. Well, don't know that that's why, but. Properly constructed traverses they build a house and bombproofs. mud. <clears throat> Clay. Mud. And clay. Mud. Properly constructed traverses and bomb proofs prevented forts from easily being taken out of action <laughs> on the flank. DuPont attempted to address the shortcomings as best he could while preparing for the attack on Charleston. He ordered the strengthening of the decks with additional armor. He attempted to create a submarine torpedo exploder on the bow of his vessels to clear mines. He added as many ironclads to the assault as possible and increased the total volume of fire against the defenses. Admiral DuPont's warnings and concerns about the inability of monitors to reduce earthen forts would go unheeded as he prepared the assault on Charleston Harbor. Why would it go unheeded? He just did a demonstration and tried it. Well, it didn't work out. I know, but he just his warnings about the inability of them to reduce the earthen forts would go unheeded. Oh. So people didn't listen to him. Right. They're like, oh, well, we're doing it anyway. Uh, the assault was a failure, and an ironclad was lost in the attempt on the Charleston Harbor, which we'll get to. Um, Fort McAllister would not be subdued by naval bombardment, but would succumb to an infantry assault at the end of Sherman's March to the Sea, famous Sherman's March to the Sea, right. in December of 1864. Doesn't it go from Atlanta to the sea or something like that? Yeah. Uh, idiots. Why didn't they just do... Well, I mean, I guess they didn't really want Fort McAllister at this time, but... Or need it. But they could have just put their infantry up. Why didn't they? Clearly. They couldn't get it from the direction they were coming from. That's why they had, that's uh, the but they, why Sherman they got it. couldn't go around, right? Because then Sherman was already around them. Mm. Right. Well, that's going to do it for us. This episode of Battles of the American Civil War. Pointless. And Stupidity. two point. Well, I guess the second one was more necessary for. Wait, what's nobody even took the. Uh, well, DuPont knew. Yeah, he did. <laughs> nobody else, though, apparently. Um. The first one, yeah, it was just stupid. That was like the uh, the COVID trials. <laughs> <laughs> the COVID shot trials. They knew it, but they didn't listen. Right. <laughs> Idiots. Hilarious, huh? Yep. So to uh well one was good, but the 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 um, so the Confederate here, yeah. Confederate get the second one too? Confederates are champions of the world. 
Both of them? Heavyweight champions of the world. 2-0 oh on this episode? They are 2-0 oh on this episode, and soon to be three in a row. Wow. Um, yeah, coming up next week, we'll have the Battle of Thompson Station, the Battle they of... They counted Bat for Battle of Fort McAllister as a battle, a sea battle? Yeah. I guess. How many people died? We didn't even get none of that. Yeah. Lots. It was a sea battle. It was important. It was somewhat. Yeah. Well, Tom's the station next week with Fort Anderson, Kelly's Ford, and Vaults Hill all uh, in a row there. There's, I think the only one that's a real, yeah, Kelly's Ford is a long one, and then the other three are literally like two paragraphs no. each. Um, those are both, these are all C's and D's coming up all the way, literally C's and D's until April 30th when Chancellors we get the batter of Chancellorsville in one. Virginia. A we got a lot one. of Louisiana, Missouri, and Mississippi actions going on, too. Um, yeah, that'll be those four battles next week. Join us then. Also, Outlaws and Gunslingers and Battles of the American Civil War, as well as Patreon.com forward slash Bang Dang, where this episode right here that you guys are listening to is... The first since we started back up video versions again, so that's on patreon.com forward slash bang dang. You get this, they got that two days earlier than this. So if you're listening on the day this released, there's people out there that's already listened and watched. So uh, sign up there, two bucks a month, and you get Outlaws and Gunslingers, Battles of the American Civil War, and This Week in Sports History, all ad free, plus at least two days early on all of those shows. And go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Go check out our Instagram, Outlaws and Gunslingers. And I think there's a Bang Dang Network one. We got a lot of stuff. We'll put it all in the description here. So we'll be back next week with uh, four more battles. And we're slowly building up to uh, Gettysburg for this year, our big oh. battle of the year. So we shall see you then. And we are the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang Dang. <laughs>